So in this video, we're going to take a closer look at carburetor technology and some of the different features that you see on a carburetor. And we talked the last time about Bernoulli's principle and how it works to be able to, to have a constriction in the airflow, which causes a negative pressure, a vacuum, which will pull fuel from a reservoir into the airstream. Well, now we need to understand a little bit more about, about how these will work in the different types of carburetors and how we control things. So let's first of all start and look at a couple different configurations of carburetors. And these are three common configurations that you'll see. And we can spend a little more, more time talking about why you would want one over the other in certain situations. Uh, one is better than others. But I just wanted to look at the three basic types and have us understand. And it really boils down to which way the air flows through them. So the first carburetor, this one looks a lot like that one that we looked at when we were looking at basic principles, where the air is just flowing horizontally from left to right. Uh, this one we call a natural or a cross-flow carburetor, so a cross-flow carburetor. So that the, the air is just flowing across. Typically, the fuel is in a reservoir down below the carburetor, and it, the fuel is pulled up into the carburetor in a couple of different ways. So that's a cross-flow carburetor. The one in the middle here is what we call a downdraft carburetor, downdraft. So the airflow is flowing down through that carburetor, and you can see that the reservoir is off to the side here with the tube going up into the airflow, and as the the airflow that goes through, here's the restriction, it's going to pull the, the fuel out and, and mix it in with the fuel stream as it goes down through. Here's an example of a downflow or downdraft carburetor. This is what you would typically see on an automobile. So a lot of gearheads might recognize this as, a, as an Elderbrock uh, four-barrel carburetor. This would be a performance carburetor that you put on an old muscle car, for instance. But the air is going to flow down through these big ports here. The fuel is introduced inside here. And then underneath, the air, the air fuel mixture is going to go down down into a manifold and be distributed, be distributed to the different pistons in that engine. So that would be a downdraft carburetor. Again, a cross-flow carburetor, typical of what you're going to see on your small gas engines. Um, this is what they would look like here, downdraft carburetor. And then the third tarp is the updraft carburetor. So downdraft and here's an updraft. Although most of the time the updraft carburetor is going to have a right angle turn in it. So you see the air is coming in horizontally. It's going to turn and exit the carburetor out the top so it's going up out of the top of the carburetor the reservoir is over on the right here you can see it's pulling the fuel out of that reservoir up into the airstream so and here's a picture of one of those installed these are very common on agricultural engines uh, older agricultural engines where we have the airflow coming in from the left into this carburetor it's going to turn and go up through pick up the fuel here's the the fuel reservoir on the right and then the manifold would be up above up here where it distributes it to the different cylinders on that engine so that's three common configurations of those carburetors. Now let's see what, what some of the things that we do in the carburetor to help them control the fuel flow a little bit better. So one of the things we need to do, fuel and airflow. So let's first look at how we control the airflow through a carburetor. And a lot of times carburetors do, most carburetors do actually control the air as well as the fuel flow. And those two are very closely tied as we know. So there's two different things on a carburetor that control the airflow that goes through it. There's one upstream that catches the air that affects the amount of air that enters the carburetor. This we call the choke plate. And then there's one downstream from the venturi or from the, the fuel induction point there, and that's called the throttle plate. So the choke plate and the throttle plate. On this downdraft carburetor, you see them over here. Choke plate up on top, coming down through, throttle plate down on the bottom. So let's talk about that throttle plate first and see what it does. So the throttle plate, and, and the way these physically are, if you picture that, that carburetor is just a round opening in there, those throttle plates are literally a plate that when we want air airflow to go through there, that plate is in line with the air stream. When we want to restrict the airflow, we just turn the plate. And so we'll see these in lab, we'll tear them apart. So we turn the plate, it covers the hole so the air can't flow through. So when we want air to flow, we open it up and allow the, the air to flow through. So you see on this one that this throttle is, is very open, so it's not restricting, it's allowing the airflow to come through. Same thing over here, this choke plate is open. Down here we see the throttle plate is partially closed, so it's restricted the amount that's flowing out 
of it. So let's look at the throttle plate first. The throttle plate is what we use to control the speed of the engine. So this is going to be tied to the governor. We've talked about the governor in the past when we look at performance curves and stuff like that. So this is going to, as we close this throttle plate, over here we close this throttle plate, that's going to restrict how much of this air fuel mixture can come out of the carburetor. So if that engine is running too fast, we want to slow it down a little bit. We close this throttle plate and that's going to restrict how much that air fuel mixture goes in the engine. It's going to reduce the power that it can develop and so that engine is going to slow down and that's how we can control the engine speed. So we just close that off. So you think about that engine, if I'm running it, you know, like when we started with our dynamometer test, we hook the engine up to a dynamometer, we turn it on, we run it wide open, there's no load on it, so that engine is running free, there's no resistance to it, so it's wanting to run away, so that throttle plate is going to be closed. So we often, that's kind of hard to get our head wrapped around sometimes because we think about, oh, the engine's running fast, the throttle must be wide open. Actually, no, the throttle plate here is going to be closed because the engine's not demanding anything. There's no power needing to come out of the engine, so it's just running fast. Now, when I start to load that engine down and there's some demand on it and it needs to do some work, that's when the governor is going to say, oh, yeah, we need a little bit more power out here. The engine's starting to slow down, so let's put to it. So what that's going to do then is open this throttle plate, open it and open and open it more and more and more, however much it needs to be able to get that engine up to its maximum speed. And then when we talk about governor's maximum, that's when this throttle plate is wide open, like you see on this carburetor over here. There's no restriction to that airflow, and that's, that's allowing as much of that air fuel mixture into the engine as it can pull through this carburetor. So that's its wide open throttle or its governor's max position. So that's the throttle plate. The throttle plate is controlling how much that air fuel mixture goes into the engine, ultimately controlling the speed of that engine. Now let's look at the choke plate up front. The choke plate is used only to start the engine. So when I start a cold engine, I need a lot more fuel in that engine than I normally would for it to operate correctly. So what I do to get more fuel in the engine is I close down the airflow going into the carburetor. So you see in this example, this choke plate is closed. So I'm not allowing the airflow to come through the carburetor. I'm restricting how much of that comes through. And sometimes there will be little holes in there so you can't completely close it off and starve it. But it's going to greatly restrict the amount of air that can go into the carburetor. Now that sometimes changes the porting and changes the fuel flow and so forth in the carburetor. So if you look at this particular example, you know, when the choke plate is open, I can have a lot of, of airflow rate going through. The Bernoulli's principle is working in here. I'm getting the fuel getting pulled up out of there and mixed with the air and away we go. Now when I close the choke plate, you'll notice in this picture that there's a very small port that comes down into the top of the reservoir. So as this engine over here is trying to pull air through that carburetor, the air can't come through the choke plate, so it actually, this hole is up front of the choke plate, so it's actually pulling this air down into the fuel and it's gonna be sucking a whole lot of fuel. So it's gonna really dump the fuel up into this this passage up here and what air can get through there is going to have a lot of fuel in it going to go into that engine it's going to allow us to get the engine started again this is only for starting a cold engine if you close this choke plate while the engine's normally running then you're going to have way too much fuel going into that engine it's not going to run well and at this point, I want to introduce some terminology to you. I've talked about the air-fuel ratio, how much air do we have versus how much fuel, you know, do we want more fuel and less fuel. So I'm going to introduce a couple terms to you, and I'm going to talk about a rich mixture or a lean mixture. So we talk about running an engine rich or a richer mixture. That means more fuel for the amount of air. So it's richer, it's thicker, there's more fuel in the air. If it's a leaner engine or a leaner operation, that means there's less fuel. So if I make the engine richer, put more fuel in. Make it leaner, put less fuel in. And again, this has to do with that ratio of how much fuel I'm putting in versus how much air is going into the engine. And that ratio has to be correct for that engine to operate correctly. So if I close this choke, for instance, 
I get a really, really rich mixture because I'm limiting the amount of airflow that can come through there. In fact, there's no air flowing across this Venturi, so Bernoulli's principle doesn't work. I don't have this negative pressure there because of Bernoulli's principle, but what I do have is some of these other ports directly pulling the fuel up out of that bowl, so I get a huge amount of fuel that's dumping in there. Not much, not much air, so it's a very, very rich mixture. It'll start the engine, but if you try to run the engine, like that if it'll run at all it's going to smoke it's going to sound bad it's going to smell bad because it's going to be a lot of raw fuel getting dumped straight out of the engine that's not going to be able to burn so that's the, the rich and the lean mixture okay so that's how they work that's why we do the airflow control two things again the choke plate is up front used only for starting the engine the throttle plate is downstream that's what we use to control the engine speed Okay, so keep in mind those two things for, for airflow control. So how do we adjust that air fuel ratio? How do we change the richness or the leanness of the mixture as it's coming out of the carburetor? Well, there's a number of different ways that manufacturers do it, but the bottom line is what we have to do is make some kind of restriction in that path of where the fuel goes from the reservoir into the carburetor, into the airstream. And that can be done in a number of different ways. Sometimes some carburetors are pre-adjusted, so manufacturers will put a restriction in there, an orifice of some kind, and that is fixed. It doesn't ever get changed. The user can't adjust it, so it's preset from the factory to operate the way they think that engine should operate. But oftentimes the user does have some ability to change that or adjust that mixture. And so this example, as we show here in this drawing, shows a needle valve or a needle, an adjusting needle that gets threaded up through the carburetor body into this, this fuel stream and it interrupts the fuel stream. And so I can change that by screwing that needle out or in by, I can change how much of that fuel is going to get pulled up into the carburetor, thereby adjusting the richness or the leanness of that mixture, how much, what that air fuel ratio is. And so that's a pretty simple way to be able to do that. So you can see that there. Um, there's some other things when we, when we actually tear into these carburetors, you're going to find out that this jet, this part of the carburetor we call the jet, it's where the fuel, the path of fuel takes into the airstream that atomizes the fuel, that there's a lot going on there. So this illustration down here is the same carburetor, but it shows that there's some holes in the side of it, and there's a lot of stuff going on. So for instance, in my lawnmower, as I'm mowing through my yard, if I have a big clump of grass somewhere, and I'm rocking along and, and the mower's doing well and I go into that clump of grass, I would like that engine to be able to respond and not get bogged way down when it hits that clump of grass and then take it a long time to recover back to its speed. I'd like that engine to be able to respond quickly. So what they do with, with this jetting down here, with the holes in the side of the jet, there's some space around that jet that will actually fill up with fuel while that engine is at, at an, an idle where there's not a lot of demand for fuel. And then when I get that big demand, when I hit that clump of grass, there's all this extra fuel in there that can get pulled into the engine and pulled into the carburetor. Give me that blast of extra fuel to be able to get me through that clump of grass. So it's like for acceleration. It's accelerating. So same thing if I'm accelerating a vehicle or something like that. I'd like that thing to be able to have a little pre-charge of gas, a little extra goose to get me going. And so that's what we'll do. Um, when this thing is drawing a lot of fuel through, there it'll pull the fuel out of this space around that jet and then there's actually an air passage from the from the carburetor from the air passway into this this jet space and so when it's pulling a lot of fuel fuel through there this air will get mixed in with that fuel and it'll help it to atomize so it'll mix it up a little bit when it comes out of here I'm gonna get smaller atoms smaller droplet sizes and I get better fuel air mixing as that goes out of that carburetor into the engine so again a lot of things happen and we'll see this when we tear the jet out of the carburetor in our lab engines that there's little holes on the side of that jet and that's what those holes are for they do a couple different things there now the other thing I want to point out is the fact that we can have more than one adjustment, more than one path for the fuel to get from the reservoir into the airstream. And so in this carburetor you see 
two different adjusting screws here. One is for the, the idling of the engine, idle when there's no load, so a no load condition. So that would be when this throttle plate is closed and then when the throttle plate is open, I'm gonna have a different jet that's gonna kick in and then give me a different air fuel ratio so that that engine can respond and give me the power that I need. So there's a good illustration of that in your textbook that I've pulled out that kind of shows what's happening and what's going on there. So very similar, here's the reservoir down here, here's the jet, and there's actually two different jets. So there's one adjustment you see on the bottom here and another adjustment that you see on the top. So in this condition that you see on the left-hand side over here, the throttle plate is closed. So this is a condition where I'm not requiring an awful, or, or I'm not, yeah, I'm not requiring an awful lot of power. The engine might be running high, but there's no load on it no resistance so it doesn't need a lot of fuel it doesn't need a lot of air to keep the thing working and so in that case this throttle plate has shut down so there's not a lot of air flowing through this carburetor so the Bernoulli principle right here in the narrow place in the carburetor there's not very much pressure because there's difference because there's not very much air flow through there so it's not really pulling the fuel through this main jet out into here but there is this other small jet up here and because there's some suction over here because the engine's trying to pull air in there there is some little bit of a vacuum or a lower pressure over here that's going to draw some of the air through here through this port and it's going to pull some of that fuel out through here so this needle valve or this this needle ad adjusting needle is the one that's going to control how much of that fuel comes out so when the engine is at we call this idle conditions and idle doesn't necessarily mean low speed it could be at high speed as well but idle meaning I'm not doing a lot of work so it's running it's happy but there's no real load on it there's no drag on the engine and so it's going to pull the fuel out of that thing now when I put a load on that thing, when my lawnmower hits that clump of grass or whatever happens, or my dynamometer, I put a whole big load on that engine, that throttle plate is going to open up because the governor is going to be connected to it. And then the governor is going to say, whoa, we need more power. It opens that throttle plate up. Now I get a lot of airflow going through my carburetor. Bernoulli's principle really kicks in here at this this narrower passageway and now I've got the the low pressure right there that's going to start drawing the fuel through this port through this jet down here and this would be the main or the the low jet that sometimes we they call it high idle but that's the main jet the the, the load jet that controls how much fuel goes into the engine when it's really working and so that one will kick in so we got two different paths for that fuel to get into that airstream depending on whether I need a lot of power or whether I don't need a lot of power. That allows our engines to run more efficiently, to run more cleanly with cleaner emissions, save on fuel usage when I don't need a lot of fuel, so that's what we do. So again, you start to see that there's a lot of things going on in those carburetors and, and it, they can get even more complicated from here, so there's a lot of things that can be happening. So that's kind of the control. That's how we do the adjustment, the main types of controls on the carburetor. Again, what I want you guys to understand out of this is, hey, we can have you know, how Bernoulli's principle is working, how these jets are working, how the, the, the needle adjusting needles are working in there to restrict the flow, to, to control how much fuel goes into the air and control that airflow ratio, the leanness or the richness of that mixture as it goes into the engine. Now let's look a little bit more at this reservoir down here and think about, okay, how do we control that? And here's another needle valve. So we use, talk, use the word needle a lot when we talk about carburetors. So there's an adjusting needles on those jets that'll control how much stuff comes in and out. But there's also a needle valve here that controls the level of fuel in that reservoir, in the bowl on the carburetor. And we usually have some type of a float in there. And here's a picture of a typical float. This is very typical of what you'll probably see in your lab engine when you tear the carburetor apart. Just a, a piece of plastic, maybe hollow, um, that will float on top of the fuel. As the fuel level comes up, the float comes up, you can see that this needle is connected to that float. The fuel supply is coming from here. The fuel supply wants to go in, but when the float comes up and push this, pushes this needle up into the hole, that shuts off the fuel supply and holds the level in the reservoir. When the level goes 
uh, when the level starts to drop down, that float is going to come down. It's going to open up this needle. It's going to allow the fuel to, to flow through. So it controls the level that, of that float. Now, some of the older carburetors, this was a, a metallic piece in there, a hollow met, uh, metal like a donut. And a lot of times those would fail. You'd get a little hole in it or the weld on the, on the parts would come loose. And then they'd start to fill up with fuel. And what would happen is that that float would not float high. It would actually sink down into the to the fuel a little bit. And maybe it would still work, but the fuel level would have to go up higher to push hard enough on that float to get it to shut off. And when that's the case, that very seriously affects the operation of this jet. Because if this level of fuel is, is gets higher, it's going to make more fuel go into there. So what happens a lot of times, the engine will run really rich when this float starts to fail because it allows too much fuel to be in that bowl. And so that was something that, that would have to be replaced or repaired periodically on older carburetors. But again, a lot of our newer carburetors, it's a plastic piece that can still fail, um, but still maybe a little bit more reliable and some other things. Now let me ask you another question when we look at this. So we think about chainsaws and string trimmers and stuff like that, and we talked about two-cylinder engines, and we use those things upside down and right side up in all different orientations. Can this carburetor work upside down? So think about that. If I turn this on its side, that float is no longer going to work. I'm not going to have the reservoir in there. That jet's not going to be picking up the fuel from the right place. And no, it's not going to work. So this carburetor can only work when it's upright. You turn it over, the carburetor is not going to function. So how do we do this with our little two-cycle engines or chainsaws, even four-cycle four engines that can run upside down. How do we do that? Well, we have a little different carburetor technology, and they're called diaphragm carburetors. And this is what they would look like if you pull them out of a string trimmer or a little blower or, or something like that. Uh, chainsaws, that's what those carburetors would look like. Very small, very simple things. They do not have a reservoir in them. What they do is they use a rubber diaphragm. So it's a flexible diaphragm, a flexible uh, type of membrane. And, and what happens is if we can get that membrane to flex a little bit, it'll actually open up a spot. So you can see how I kind of open up a hole. I get it to close down. I open up, close down. I kind of create a pump. So I can use that diaphragm kind of as a pump. And there's a number of different ways that we do this. And so this diagram kind of shows that we're using the, the draw or the suction from the piston as the intake stroke is happening in the engine. And we're pulling the air through that carburetor. That's going to draw a vacuum on this diaphragm, right? Here's a diaphragm. This blue is atmospheric air in this particular case. That's going to draw that diaphragm up because it's connected to this needle valve on this pivot here. It'll actually lower the needle valve as the diaphragm comes up. That's going to pull a spurt of fuel into this chamber and allow it to go up into the engine. <clears throat> when I'm not drawing, when the, when the intake valve closes or whatever happens so that I'm not pulling fuel through anymore, the spring is going to return this thing. It's going to push that needle back up into the port, shut it off, so I no longer have fuel flow going through there. And so that's how, the, it's one of the ways that we can do that. And there's a number of different ways you'll see actually we'll use the vacuum from the engine sometimes to pull the diaphragm the other direction and actually pull fuel and pump it out. So kind of in the same principle as your two cycle engine, that crankcase is pressurized that we run the fuel through that. We use the, the fact that that crankcase can be pressurized in a four stroke engine, but we're not running fuel through that chamber anymore, but we you do use that vacuum to run pumps and run carburetors and things like that. And that allows us to be able to go upside down. This one is really not dependent on the orientation. So that carburetor can be turned in all different directions. These carburetors over here can go sideways. So you can see there's the diaphragm out of this carburetor. This carburetor is a little different. Again, there's the diaphragm. Um, this is a cover that goes over the top. So this is that chamber in there. And there's a little needle valve right there that allows the fuel to come in and out. So as this rubber diaphragm 
flexes up and down against this little spring that moves the fuel and pumps the fuel in and out. So in your tank then, on the fuel tank, there's usually a hose that goes in the tank that you can just kind of flop around in the tank. So if you turn the tank over, that hose flops down at the bottom of the tank. As the tank comes back up, the hose flops down. So that hose always stays in the fuel so that this carburetor can grab the fuel, pull the fuel up from the tank, and we can come in at any in any orientation. So that just gives you an idea of how the carburetors work of what's going on in these carburetors, how we're getting that fuel mixed into the fuel stream and uh, and how we can do it actually without the orientation so we can have uh, something that's not orientation dependent that I can run upside down or in any orientation.